Are you in the library? No, uh, this is just a virtual background. I'm in my <laughs> office, though. Oh, it looks great. <laughs> but this is not my office. This is the <laughs> library of the American Academy in Rome. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening for those who are in Turkey and good afternoon for those who are in USA or in other parts of the world. Um, tonight we have a very important guest uh, who is going to speak uh, about the recent excavations uh, in Go at Gordion and uh, Charles Brian Rose from Pens Pennsylvania University. Mm -hmm. But uh, before, uh, let me tell you about something about the, uh, our Center for Mediterranean Studies at Yesha University before introduce Brian Rose to you. Um, our center, Center for Mediterranean University at Yashar, or Center for Mediterranean Studies, sorry, at Yashar University, is a multidisciplinary research center, uh, center which is uh, try to conduct uh, research on political, social, and ecological issues in the Mediterranean base, basin. And we, our main aim is to provide everybody or academics, a platform for exchange of ideas policy, between academics, policymakers, and students about the Mediterranean basin. And the center organizes its activities under three clusters, actually. Archaeology is one of them, but we have also, we study also ecology, economy, and politics, culture, and history. And public outreach is a very important part of our center. Uh, that's why we organize these live YouTube uh, conferences, conferences, and throughout this winter, we will be organizing such talks uh, on archaeology and other issues uh, which has to do with the Mediterranean. And please follow us. Please keep following us. Uh, we, we will have uh, also other talks here uh, presented by uh, different scholars. So Brian Rose, actually, he, he received his PhD in art history and archaeology from Columbia University in 1987 for his, for his thesis titled julio Claudian Dynastic Group Monuments. From 1987 to 2005, he taught in the Classics Department at the University of Cincinnati serving as head of the department from 2002 until 2005. And he is currently the James Pritchard Professor of Archaeology at the University of Pennsylvania in the Classical Studies Department. Um, and Rose has, I mean, it's very difficult to <laughs> introduce him very briefly, but I'm going to try. He also uh, received the gold medal of the Archaeological Institute of America in 2015. 
and he also received fellowships from the American Academy in Rome, the American Academy in Berlin, uh, the Samuel Crest Foundation, Loeb Classical Library Foundation, and the American Research Institute in Turkey. Um, Brian Rose, in 1994, he and his collaborator, Manfred Korfman, the late Professor Manfred Korfman, who conducted the excavations at Troy, uh, received the Max Planck Prize of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. And in 2012, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he is a corresponding, ma corresponding member of the German Archaeological Institute and the Australian Archaeological Institute. And his research is uh, focused mainly on Anatolia, and he was the head of the post Bronze Age excavations at Troy between, after very recently after he received his PhD, I think between 1988 uh, until 2009. Is, is this correct? I'm, I yeah, might be 2012. mistaken. <laughs> That's uh, where else I also uh, uh, met Brian Rose. <laughs> Between 2003 and 2007, he directed the Granicus River Valley Survey Project, which focused on re recording and mapping of the Greco-Roman tombs that dominate northwest, northwestern Turkey. Um, so he had many numerous publications on the archaeological sites of Troy and Gordian, and on the political and artistic relationship between Rome and the provinces. Let me introduce also this, his last book, last publication, the, the Archaeology of Greek and Roman Troy, which was uh, from the Cambridge University Press in 2014. Uh, so we are very grateful to have Brian Rose here uh, tonight with us. He's going to uh, talk about the recent excavations at Gordion, royal city of King Midas. We are uh, so very excited to have you, Brian. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And the floor, floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sinan. And thanks to all of you for coming uh, to the lecture tonight. The site of Gordian is located about an hour's drive southwest of Ankara, so very easy to visit, and served as the capital of the Phrygian Kingdom, which had its primary period of power during the Iron Age from the 9th through the early 6th centuries BC. And that will be the focus of what I speak about tonight. You're seeing, obviously, a map of the extent of Phrygia on the left side at the point that it would have reached during the reign of Gordian's or Phrygia's most important king, most powerful king, whose name was Midas. So that is the late eighth century BC map of Phrygia. On the right, you're seeing an aerial view of the mound of Gordian, the citadel mound of Gordian, which is about four times the size of the mound of Troy. So that will give you an idea of its extent. The site was first excavated for only a few months in 1900 by German archaeologists working with engineers who were helping to build the railroad stretching from Berlin to Baghdad. But the most important excavations were launched under the uh, auspices of the Penn Museum uh, in 1950, and they've continued until the present. So this is the 70th anniversary of excavations at Gordian. The Mound of Gordian is not unlike the Mound of Troy. It's composed of nine settlements, one built on top of the other and spanning a period of about 4,000 years. So from the early Bronze Age, about 2400 BC until the Seljuk period, so 14th century AD. So in terms of its complexity, it's very similar to Troy. And like Troy, I've done a color phase plan of the buildings on the citadel from the so-called Phrygian periods 
first millennium BC, which you see on the right. So to do it for all nine phases of habitation would be too complex. But if you look at the map on the right, you can see in red the early Phrygian period from 950 to 800. And that is the best preserved of the periods in terms of the, the buildings and the monuments. I'll say more about that in a minute. Then there was a terrible fire around 800 BC, and we move into the middle Phrygian period. There's no change in population between early Phrygian and middle Phrygian. It's the same people. They simply rebuild their city on a higher level and a much more powerful state in the 8th century BC. And this is the period of Midas, again, the most powerful of the Phrygian kings. The Middle Phrygian period uh, ends with the Persian attack on the city in the 540s BC. And then we move into the Persian phase, the Persian dominated phase, late Phrygian, which would last for a little over 200 years until the uh, arrival of Alexander the Great. The city doesn't end then. There's a very strong Hellenistic phase where we have Celtic migrants coming into the area and Phrygia becomes Galatia and also a very strong Roman phase when it served as a military outpost for the Romans. And then continuing on into the Seljuk period. Tonight, what I will focus on are the early and middle Phrygian remains. So from the 10th century to the 6th century, because those are the ones that are best preserved. One of the most striking features of Gordian is that in addition to the large citadel mound, where the most important buildings are located, the mound is surrounded by about 125 monumental burial mounds or tumuli. These are the earliest tumuli that have ever been found in Asia Minor, beginning around 850 BC and continuing on into the early Roman period. So as you approach the site of Gordian, you walk through this very unusual valley filled with monumental burial mounds that at least early in its history were unlike any other landscape in Asia Minor. One of the burial mounds is larger than the other and I'll say more about that a little later. This is the Midas Mound, not the tomb of Midas himself, but probably the tomb of Midas's father. And this kind of organization for a city would reappear in Sardis after the Lydian conquest of Western Asia Minor. One of the most interesting features of the citadel and the landscape that surrounds it is the coordination between the architecture and the tombs. And so if we look at the early Phrygian entrance, to the site of Gordian, which was built around 850 BC. It was organized in such a way that when you passed through the gate, your eyes were directed toward the oldest of the royal burial mounds at Gordian, Tumulus W, which is about 850 BC. You can see that here. So as one is leaving, one focuses one's eyes on the oldest burial mound at the site. So there's a dialogue between the architecture of the citadel and the oldest of the burial mounds. This is also the oldest burial mound in all of Turkey, all of Asia Minor. And this orientation uh, will become important later when I discuss a second burial mound. So let me say a little more about the early Phrygian gateway into the site. This is the largest and best preserved Iron Age citadel gate in all of Turkey. And it had you see a reconstruction of it in the lower section of the slide, again dating to about 850 BC. This had been damaged in the earthquake of 1999 which of course had its center at Izmit, and that had 
destabilized the masonry of the gate. And you see that the gate still survives to a height of 10 meters. So originally it would have been about 16 meters high, really of colossal size. The first 10 meters would have been stone and then probably six meters of mud brick of carpitch above that. So because it's as well preserved as it is, we wanted to develop a conservation program to stabilize the masonry after the earthquake. This was not easy to do, but we finished it in 2019. It took six years to do it. And the only way we could do it was to take down the upper sections of the walls that had been damaged by the earthquake to consolidate the blocks, stabilize the blocks, and then to reinsert the original blocks in their original position. We also used stainless steel bars to anchor the facade of the gate to the rubble fill behind it so that if there is another earthquake, and of course, as you know better than I, especially in Izmir, these earthquakes can come at any time. So we have restored it in a way that will enable it to be stable even if there is another earthquake over the course of the next hundred years. One of the things we did at the top of the gate was to install a system that we call soft capping or green capping. It's a green friendly solution to conservation. So on top of the restored gate, this is all finished, we put a carapitch frame so we surround it with carapitch with mud brick. And then within the mud brick, we plant shallow rooted plants, something called poa. So these are green plants with shallow roots and the roots will grow deep enough to take in the excess water during the rainy season in the winter, but they won't grow so deep that they disturb the stability of the masonry. So as I say, it's a green solution to conservation. It enables the walls to breathe in a natural way, but it maintains the stability of the walls. So we call this green capping or soft capping. If one went through the early Phrygian citadel gate into the citadel in the ninth century BC, you would have seen a large series of megarons, large mansions with a main room, usually with a hearth and an ante room or vestibule, which also usually had a hearth. These were enormous spaces. And so you can see a reconstruction of one of these megarons from the Citadel of Gordian on the right. So a length of nearly 20 meters and a width of 15 meters, a height over 12 meters. So these were among the largest megarons of Central Asia Minor during the Iron Age. Connected with some of these megarons, we have musical instruments. So tortoise shell lyres. You can see a reconstruction of some of these lyres here. The ones that we have date to the late eighth, early seventh, centuries BC, so roughly to the period of King Midas. And as you can see, the shells of the turtles have been adapted for music. And you can see some of these, sorry, some of these tortoiseshell lyres here, which would have formed part of the lyres themselves. These musical instruments would have been played on special occasions when there were ambassadors coming from Ionia, from Assyria, from the Neo-Hittite city-states in southeastern Turkey. No doubt there would have been stories that were told with music, some of which perhaps became part of Homer's Iliad. You know in Homer's Iliad, which was written down when Midas was on the throne of Gordian, you have a lot of attention directed to Phrygia. The wife of Priam, a woman named Hecuba, is Phrygian, 
and the soldiers of Phrygia are highlighted as being extraordinarily powerful. So what they're doing, what the Iliad is doing is reflecting the power of the Phrygian kingdom, the power of the capital city of Gordian during the period of Homer, during the period of Midas. Some of the megarons were elaborately decorated. You see one of the earliest decorated pebble mosaics ever found dating to about 825 BC, which is the floor of one of these megarons. The dating of this mosaic floor is clear, late ninth century BC. Whether it's the absolute earliest pebble mosaic is harder to say, but it's certainly one of the earliest. So you see the excavation of the pebble mosaic here, and then a watercolor reconstruction of it with the hearth in the center and a detail of one of the panels. The Phrygians favored geometric decoration over figural decoration. And so you can see here, as we look at the color rendition of the mosaic, it's as if you have a whole series of carpets with, so kilims, with geometric designs that have been laid in different positions on the floor. And what's interesting is that this Megaron was next to the textile production center of Gordian, where those carpets were probably made. So this gives us a sense of the kinds of carpets that would have been produced at Gordian in the late ninth century BC. Again, a geometric design. This same building had a stone acroterion above the roof, the earliest stone acroterion that has ever been discovered. Again, dating to the late ninth century BC, much earlier than what we find in Greece. Some of the megarons were decorated with textiles on the walls. So the walls themselves would have been elaborately decorated. And those textiles fell down during the fire of 800 BC. This is what they look like when they're excavated. But with conservation, we can unroll them, conserve them, and get a reconstruction of what the textiles originally looked like, as you see here on the lower part of the slide. Again, the focus is on geometric decoration, as we saw in the pebble mosaic floor that I just showed you. And it's similar in some respects to the wooden serving stands, also with geometric decoration, that were excavated in the Midas Mound tumulus, which dates to about 740 BC. Recently, we tried to do a three-dimensional reconstruction of the Megarons of Gordian. And for this, we turn to the monuments of Midas City, the most elaborate of the monuments at Midas City, which contains a dedication to Midas himself, dates to the late eighth century BC. The dating of this goes back and forth. I'm convinced that it was carved when Midas was on the throne, so late eighth century BC. The height of the facade in Midas City is 17 meters and the width is the same. That's exactly the same as what we have in the Megarons of Gordian. So my guess is that what the monuments of Midas City are copying are the facades of the Megarons at Gordian. And so we've used these facades as our inspiration for the reconstruction of the facades of the Megarons. This is not at all surprising because again, geometric decoration was what they excelled at at Gordian. So I bring back the geometric decoration of the mosaic floor, the geometric decoration of the wooden serving stands from the Midas Mount tumulus and the geometric decoration of ninth and eighth century Phrygian pottery. 
this was the way they conceived of the world, or at least conceived of the decoration for the buildings in which they would conduct the business of the Phrygian state. So I think this is not unlikely, but of course is only a hypothesis. If this is true, if there was this kind of painted decoration on the facades of Gordian, as we have on the facades of Midas City, it makes you wonder about the geometric temple models that we have from Greece from the same period, 8th century BC. So from the sites of Argos and Parakora. When people have looked at these models in the past, they've seen the geometric decoration on the roofs and on the walls, and they thought that it was just the artist's decision for decoration, that it had no connection to actual life. But if the facades of Gordian were decorated with these elaborate geometric schemes, it's not unlikely that these temple models are recreating the original designs of those temples, of the large scale temples in the eighth century BC. As I said, there was a terrible fire around 800 BC. It probably started in the industrial district. So in the so-called terrace building district, which is where the textiles were made and where all the cooking for the citadel took place. We can date this by dendrochronology and by radiocarbon to 800 BC. It's 100 years earlier than Rodney Young, the earlier excavator of Gordian, had believed. The destruction level is in a good situation. So when the entire center of the citadel caught on fire, the buildings collapsed, no one went back to the buildings and looked through the pottery, the small finds, trying to find whatever was of value. They just left it as it was. So that destruction level for us is perfectly preserved. And that's how we can date it so precisely. After this happened, after the fire, the people of Gordian decided to rebuild the citadel immediately, but at a level that was five meters higher than the old one. So they rebuilt the capital city from the beginning one more time, bringing five meters of clay onto the top of the citadel, which they had taken from the riverbanks and lifted the city up five meters higher. Why would they go to all of this trouble to make the city look even more powerful than it had been? One needs to keep in mind what Gordian's competitors were doing at the same time. The Urartian citadels around Van, so from the eighth century BC, are also extremely strong and extremely high. The same thing is true for the Assyrian palaces and for the Neo-Hittite citadels in southeastern Turkey. And so I think the people of Gordian were very conscious of how strong the neighboring citadels or the adjacent citadels were. And they realized if they were to have credibility, they needed to build their citadel even higher, much higher than it had been. I was interested in determining not just what the citadel looked like in the eighth century BC, but also what the lower city, the Unterstadt, the Asha Shehir, looked like at the same time. And so I brought a remote sensing team that had worked for us at Troy. And if you look at this red rectangle, pink rectangle, this is the area that we explored. Here is the citadel mound in the center. And we used magnetic prospection to explore the area to the north and to the south, as well as east and west. And so you see uh, these two men, Stefan Giza and Christian Hubner, with their magnetometer with the Midas mound in the background. And this is the area that we explored all around the citadel mound. The citadel mound, by the way, has a very flat top. So it is a yasa huyuk. 
And that has given its name to the village in which we live, the village of Yasahuyuk. When we did the remote sensing, we got very good results. We were able to reconstruct the walls of two different residential districts, the so-called lower town. You see the walls here, north and south of the Citadel Mound. And then another residential district, the outer town, which also had a citadel wall. And all of these had defensive ditches as well, just like the defensive ditch of Troy. Rodney Young had excavated one of the forts of these outer perimeter walls, the so-called Kuchuk Huyuk. We did magnetic prospection here at the north and found traces of an unexcavated fort here. These are 8th, 7th, early 6th centuries BC, so Middle Phrygian. And we found a new fort that we hadn't known about on the western side of the outer town, also dating to the Middle Phrygian period. So the settlement um, was made up of about 100 hectares, 100 hectares, and had at least three forts that protected it. This gives you a reconstruction of what we think the situation was. So the Citadel Mound protected by fortification walls, the, out, the lower town protected by more fortification walls with a ditch in front and with forts at the north, Kuchtepe, and the southeast, Kuchukuyuk, and then another residential district, the outer town, also with fortification walls and ditch, and then another fort on the western side. Let's look at a couple of the tumuli because we have new results from the tumuli. And we start with the Midas Mound, which was excavated by Rodney Young uh, from the Penn Museum in 1957. <clears throat> For nearly 200 years, this was the largest burial mound in all of Turkey, 53 meters in height, the same height as the Buddhas of Bamiyan that had been destroyed by the Taliban. Built in 740 BC and containing inside the oldest standing wooden building in the world which I'll show you in a second. It was this organization of the landscape with monumental burial mounds that influenced the Lydians with the, uh, who uh, constructed the cemetery of Bintepe near Sardis. Although Bintepe is dating about, or gets started about 250 years after Gordian uh, begins to build its earliest burial mounds. Okay, so in the Midas Mound, we have just off the center of the burial mound, the tomb chamber, which had never been robbed in antiquity. And so again, within it, Rodney Young was able to find the oldest standing wooden building in the world, the only one of our tomb chambers that still stands. Many of you are accustomed to the tomb chambers of Ionia, where the chambers are in stone. All the Phrygian chambers were of wood, and that's why so few of them still stand. Within the Midas Mound tomb chamber was the skeleton of the dead king, probably Midas's father, and here you see a plaster reconstruction of the head based on the skull that was found. Recently, we did an analysis of the shroud, of the textile that was covering the body of the king, which seemed to be golden. And you see part of that textile here and here. This was coated with an inorganic pigment called gertite, which makes things look golden. So it's a chemical way of making your clothing look golden. And we found the same kinds of golden 
costumes or textiles used by the other aristocrats of Gordian. So our guess is that this is why the story of the golden touch develops at Gordian, the golden touch of Midas, not because they used a lot of gold, they didn't. In this tomb chamber, which was never robbed, was not one piece of gold, but the people looked golden because of the special chemical treatment that they used on their textiles, on their costumes, an indication of which you can see here. A few years ago, as we were exploring the roof of the tomb chamber, on one of the roof beams, we found four names that had been inscribed in Phrygian. Phrygian is very similar. Uh, the alphabet is very similar to Greek. So if you can read Greek, you can read Phrygian. <clears throat> uh, and so these were on the roof beams. Um, the roof beam had been signed by four men and then put on the tomb chamber. So these signatures date to 740 BC. So you can see them here, Nana, Mixos, Sitsidos, and uh, Surunis. What's interesting is that Sitsidos is also a name that was cut into the wax of one of the bronze bowls from the tomb chamber. So these bronze bowls were found all over the tomb chamber. There were a hundred of them. They were all different. It looks as if each one belonged to a different man who came to the funeral to take part in the banquet. And each one brought his own best dish from his kitchen, the finest bronze dish they had for the banquet, and then left it in the tomb chamber at the end of the meal. So we don't know who Tsitsidos was. Clearly he was a man of importance. He may have had something to do with the building of the tomb, but we've never found anything like this before. No one had ever looked for signatures on a roof beam in the other burial mounds that were excavated, but it is now something we focus on all the time. What's interesting about Midas, many things are interesting, of course, but he was the one who built that tomb for his father in 740 BC. That was the beginning of his reign. So the first thing he did as king, probably, was to build that tomb chamber. Midas was different from many of the other kings in that he reached out both east and west and probably so too did his father. So we see gifts, diplomatic gifts that are present at Gordian that probably came from Assyria or from a region that was connected to Assyria. You can see these, sorry, lion-headed, lion-headed citulas or wine buckets from Kursabad dating to the late eighth century BC Palace of Sargon II, who was a contemporary of Midas. You can see a detail of that here. Then you can look at the Sicula from the Midas Mound tomb chamber, also with lion head decoration. They're very, very similar. So it's not unlikely that these were diplomatic gifts from Assyria. At the same time, Midas was reaching out to Greece. He had married the daughter of the king of Kime in Western Turkey. <clears throat> and he was, according to Herodotus, the first of the foreign kings to make a dedication at the sanctuary of Apollo at Delphi. And at Delphi, an ivory figurine from a piece of furniture in an Anatolian style has been found. This dates to the late eighth century BC and appears to have been part of a chair or throne of some sort and it's ivory. What's interesting is that Herodotus says that the gift that Midas made at, Gord at Delphi was a wood and ivory throne. And so he says it was um, presented in the treasury of the Corinthians at Delphi. This ivory figurine was excavated in front of the treasury of the Corinthians, dates to the late eighth century. 
is in an Anatolian style and was from a chair or throne. This is probably part of the throne that Midas dedicated to Apollo at Delphi. So he's reaching out to Greece. He's reaching out to the Neo-Hittite city-states. And at a certain point toward the end of his life, he's also reaching out to Assyria, both east and west. During the eighth century, so probably just before the Midas Mound was built, there's another tumulus that we have recently excavated in conjunction with the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara. And I should stop here and say that one of the most wonderful parts of our lives at Gordian is to have the opportunity to work with the archaeologists at the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara. They have been incredibly helpful, incredibly supportive, and incredibly friendly to us from the beginning. And so it's been an honor to work with them on a number of projects. Now this tumulus, Tumulus 52, is important for a number of reasons. I had mentioned earlier that when the early Phrygian gate in red here was built, it was built so that your attention was focused on the oldest of the burial mounds at Gordian. When they rebuild the city after the fire of 800 BC, they orient the gate differently. This is in blue. So this is the new city gate, different orientation, and it's focused on this tumulus, tumulus 52. So working with the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations, you see the excavation crew here, and Ver Saar, the former director of the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations. Uh, many of you know Mustafa Metin of the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations on the right. Uh, I, am, I am here. And we started and finished in um, the summer of 2019. So here you see the Citadel Mound, here Tumulus 52, and here the Midas Mound. When we dug it, we had to go very far down, as you can imagine. This is 12 meters down. We had used remote sensing, but it pointed us in the wrong direction this time. So it took longer to reach the tomb chamber than we thought, but we did reach it. Um, it certainly dates to the eighth century BC, was made of wood. Within it were bronze omphalous bowls, similar to the kind that we find in the Midas Mount tomb chamber and a ribbed bowl uh, of bronze that you see on the right. And over 600 amber beads or what seem to be amber beads, as well as a whole series of bronze fibulae. You can see uh, some of the uh, amber um, necklaces here from Tumulus 52. These have been conserved like everything else at the Museum of Anatolian uh, Civilizations. What's especially interesting is that the body inside is that of a woman aged about 25. All the other monumental burial mounds are tombs to men. This is the tomb of a woman. So that's remarkable, especially considering that the city gate is focused on this woman. And she was buried with one of her children between the ages of eight uh, and 10. So that too is unusual. Normally you only have one body in a tomb chamber. Here we have two. There are a lot more issues and features of the tomb chamber that we're still excavating or, and that we're still conserving and that we're still analyzing. But the important thing is that it's an eighth century tomb chamber just a little before the Midas Mound tomb. And again, to a royal woman uh, who obviously was quite wealthy rather than a man. In some of these tomb chambers or near just outside the tomb chambers, we have the carts that would have brought the dead body to the burial mound. What I'm showing you here are the iron pieces 
of such a vehicle from a later tumulus. This is late 6th century BC, but you can see here the reconstruction that we've been able to do. We have several of these dating to uh, the period of Persian control. And these are being prepared for publication. I expect the volume will be published at the latest uh, by next year. There are two areas in particular where we've devoted a lot of time to excavation. One is area one, Alambir, on the southern edge of the citadel. The second, Alandert, area four, in the center of the citadel. So this is not the edge of the citadel. This entire area, everything you see on the slide is part of the citadel. So these occupy a diagonal line in the center of the citadel. When we excavated area one, we found a new gateway leading into the city, a monumental south gate to the city. Originally built in the ninth century BC, at the same time as the monumental citadel gate I showed you at the beginning of the lecture. And you can see the road is well preserved. And you can see it in this drone view of the road as it looked at the end of the 2019 season. This gateway was in operation for 1200 years, in operation longer than any other gateway at the site. This is the situation that we've reconstructed, although we have more to do, which I hope we'll be able to do in 2021. So this much we have. We think we have the corner here leading to the Northwest up to a gate building. But we won't be able to determine this until 2021. Nevertheless, that's what seems likely. All around it was a monumental stepped glacis, a stepped terrace wall that completely encircled the citadel. This was probably 10 meters high. You can see it's extremely well preserved, as is the masonry of the gate. This masonry technique looks good enough to be 6th century BC but it in fact dates to the eighth century BC, much earlier than one would expect. And you can see here with one of the walls of the gate, you get an idea how much they loved color. Using color in all of the buildings they constructed during the Middle Phrygian period. The rubble fill that they used to, um, to stabilize the gate was reinforced with monumental beams of wood. And so you can see how monumental the beams of wood were. These beams date to the eighth century BC. They were surrounded by stone rubble and placed behind the ashlar walls of the gate. We found at the entrance to the gate was a lion figure that was originally freestanding. It's not a relief, not a kabartma, but a freestanding lion that was placed at the gate, almost certainly with another one, in the 8th century BC rebuilding. And then once the Persians take control, they place the lion still at the front of the gate, but against the entrance to the gate as if it were a relief. Area four in the center of the mound was equally important. Here too, we had to dig down quite a ways, 12 meters down. So you see the walking path up here and 12 meters. When we dug down to that level, we found an enormous pit that contained a nearly complete roof of a middle Phrygian building and the building had been destroyed at the time of the Persian attack in 540 BC. The pottery is very clear, so we can date it to the time of the attack, but we've been able to conserve and reconstruct the roof from this building. So here you see the reconstruction of it, dating to the early sixth 
century BC with elaborately painted <clears throat> geometric tiles, very similar to the kinds of tiles that one finds at Sardis. Not a surprise because the Phrygians probably got the idea from the Lydians. These are all produced in the early sixth century BC. And again, they show the Lydian, the uh, Phrygian fondness for geometric decoration. In 2019, we turned our attention to the so-called mosaic building, uh, some of which was uh, excavated by Rodney Young, called the mosaic building because it had an elaborate mosaic floor, the floor of pebble mosaics. And you see it right here on the southern side of the citadel and a drawing of it here. I thought, um, I initially believed Rodney Young's dating. He said that it was built in the early fifth century and was destroyed in the fourth century. We conducted new excavations in 2019 and realized that we have to move the date back in time a hundred years. It was constructed in the early sixth century BC and destroyed in the Persian attack. So it is not the Achaemenid mosaic building. It is just the mosaic building built at a time when the Lydians had control of the area. Here are the trenches we dug in 2019. As you see here on either side of a colonnade and, in, and you can see the Midas mound in the distance. Here is the mosaic floor. We can now date this to the beginning of the sixth century BC. As you see, you've got a series of meanders, you, a, a detail here of the larger mosaic floor here. And next to it, we found the roof, again, containing elaborate geometric decoration. In this case, the dominant uh, motif was the checkerboard pattern. We have um, nearly a thousand kilos of tiles from this building, again, all with this early sixth century decoration. Next to the building, we found pieces of scale armor, bronze and iron armor, which would have been worn by the defenders of Gordian at the time of the Persian attack in 540 BC. So you see the conservation of the pieces here. This decoration in meander form is bronze on iron. What's interesting about this is that it's the same decoration that you find in Greek vase painting for the armor worn by Patroclus during the Trojan War. You can see the hooked meander decoration here. That is what we have here. And it's the same decoration that you also see, sorry, in the floor of the building. This was found at the edge of the trench. We will probably find more of it when we continue this excavation in 2021. And it will be a nice addition to the other scale armor we have from the site of Idalion on Cyprus, which is probably the same date as the armor that we found at Gordian. After the Persian attack in 540, we don't have a lot of new buildings that were constructed on the Citadel Mount, but we have one that was focused on religion, probably focused on the cult of Matar or Sibylle or Kibele or the Magna Mater, the great mother goddess of Anatolia. It's all the same person. She was the main goddess of Gordian. This is a small semi-subterranean building between two megarons. Here you can see one walking into it. The plaster of the wall had fallen in place. And so we've been able to do a reconstruction of the wall decoration which showed women, primarily women, marching toward a central object, whether it was a cult statue or something else, we don't know, we don't have it. But it's our best representation of women in Phrygia 
in the Persian period. Really, it's all that we have. There are a few men in these friezes, but primarily women. And decorating the lower parts of the walls were these ceramic cones stuck into the mud brick of the wall in geometric patterns. You see the same sort of thing at Uruk in, nor in southern Iraq in the proto-literate period in the late fourth millennium BC. And then it comes back in the sixth century and the fifth century at the site of Pazarla, uh, east of Boazkoy and at Gordian. So this is as far as I can take you in an hour's lecture, but I hope you've gotten a sense of the tremendously exciting finds that we've been lucky enough to find always with the support of the Ministry of Culture and Tourism in Ankara, uh, for whom we have the honor of working, and of course, the Anadolu Medenietleri Musesi in Ankara. So thank you for listening to me, and I will now be happy to take any questions you have. Uh, thank you very much, Brian, for this wonderful presentation of a wonderful and enormous site of Gordion and we learned a lot uh, this uh, tonight, tonight and you have really great results. If you have any questions uh, you can ask you can hear from the, there's a chat session you can ask uh, from the chat some questions but, but before that I would like to ask you a question mm -hmm. and you you mentioned the important of importance of this textile production in Gordion, I think, or we, we see these, all of these textile um, decorative uh, patterns on the walls or on the on the floors of these Megaron buildings. And do we see uh, any uh, in the in the production economy in the zoo, zoo archaeological records? Do we, do we see any? kind of, uh, let's say, um, wool production, the importance of wool, the same same aspect, wool production. Do we see that also in the zooarchaeological record of Gordia? We do. we do. It's a good question. There's a rise in the number of sheep bones that we have in the late 9th and 8th centuries BC. So as they produce more and more textiles, they need more and more space. They need to use more and more loom weights and spindle whirls. And in some of these buildings, we have between 500 and 600 loom weights. And we have a rise in the number of sheep bones. So yes, exactly. OK, then the, the economy uh, mainly during that period was based on this animal wool production was very important during that time period. Exactly. Um, and if you think of the um, relief of the king of Tabal named Warpalawa at Ivriz. There's a relief of him wearing an elaborately decorated garment, which was probably a diplomatic gift from the king of Gordian and probably from Midas himself. So yes, the textiles become an important part of the economy as well as politics. Okay, I, I have another question. You also mentioned the destruction layer of these Megaron, Megara, uh, Megaron buildings, and and afterwards, soon after the destruction of these buildings, we see a kind of a more protecting uh, building of a better fortification walls, higher fortification walls. And do you think this this uh, this fire or this destruction has to do has to do with a crisis situation at that time? No, when, just a when Rodney Young, it, it's a good question. When Rodney Young excavated this destruction level in the 1950s and 60s, he assumed that it had to be connected to an attack. And so he connected it to an attack by the Cimmerians in 700 BC. Once we analyzed uh, the uh, did radiocarbon dating on the seeds in the destruction level as well as the wood and it used dendrochronology analysis on the wood in the destruction level. We realized that it dates a century earlier, 800 BC. 
At that point, no one was attacking Gordian. And the center of the fire was in the terrace buildings, the industrial district of Gordian, very close to one of the big hearths. So I think it was simply a fire that got out of control uh, in late summer because the kinds of seeds that we have in the destruction level are associated with fruits that would have been picked in the late summer, in August. We all know what the winds are like in Turkey in late August. They're very strong. So if you imagine there's a cooking accident in the industrial sector, it catches on fire. The wind would very quickly blow that fire all around the center of the citadel. So I think it's not a political or military attack. It's just an accident that got out of control. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have some also some, also, some questions from our audiences. Um, um, let me have a look at. Akın so, Aykurt. You, uh, you, can read, you can read the question. Akın Aykurt asks you, what is the latest uh, about the origin of the Phrygians? Uh, it's wonderful to hear the name of Akın Aykurt, <laughs> with whom I traveled uh, in Turkey uh, together uh, on a, a Penn alumni tour. Uh, the origin of the Phrygians. So the Phrygians come into this area in the 12th century BC from Southeastern Europe, from the area of the Balkans. We are sure that they're coming from Southeastern Europe and we're sure that they're coming in the 12th century, these Phrygians, after the collapse of the Hittite kingdom. Once the Hittite kingdom collapses in the early 12th century BC, that seems to have opened up a commercial corridor, a commercial commercial passage from southeastern Europe to Asia Minor. So we have some people coming across the Dardanelles from southeastern Europe and settling at Troy. Others probably go across the Bosphorus and settle in Phrygia. That's why we have similarities in the pottery between Troy and Gordian. They're all coming ultimately from Southeastern Europe. That's probably also why we have so many similarities between Phrygian and Greek, because the language that the people are speaking is drawn from Southeastern Europe. And those migrants from Southeastern Europe are also migrating south into Greece at more or less the same time. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is also one question from Çiler Çilingiroğlu, and she says, as you know, Sardis has massive Bronze Age layers close to the Acropolis. Have you discovered anything similar at Gordion? Did a Bronze Age Gordion exist? Uh, yes, it's always wonderful to hear the voice of Ch Chiler Chilingirolu, <laughs> even if, if I'm not hearing it directly. Uh, we don't have the same kind of Bronze Age community that Troy had. We have a very small early Bronze Age settlement we certainly have the pottery from that settlement, but it was not a rich settlement. There's a lot about it we don't understand because the early Bronze Age levels are so deep. Keep in mind, just to get down to the sixth century BC from the top of the mound, I had to dig down 12 meters. So consider how much further I would have to go to get to 2400 BC, but there was a fairly decent sized early Bronze Age community. During the late Bronze Age, uh, there's an even larger community, although still not wealthy. And it was, it appears to have been part of the Hittite kingdom. I mean, very clearly, they're working in tandem with the Hittites. When I think of the Iliad, which of course is describing the events of the late Bronze Age, and they're describing how powerful Phrygia was in the late Bronze Age. Phrygia was not powerful in the late Bronze Age. Gordian was not powerful in the late Bronze Age. It was a small community connected to the Hittites. Gordian was strong 
in the eighth century BC when the Iliad is written down for the first time. So the Iliad is reflecting the politics of the Iron Age, not of the Bronze Age, um, at least in terms of Phrygia. But this is all by way of saying, yes, we do have a Bronze Age, uh, a set of Bronze Age uh, habitation layers, uh, both from early and from late Bronze Age, but they're not especially uh, prosperous. Okay, thank you. Um, there's also one question from, this time from Altan Chiringirolu. And uh, how can you explain, Brian, Mita in the Assyrian records of the seventh century BC, uh, if we can get to dating 100 years back? Well, the dating of the destruction level from 700 to 800 BC has nothing to do with Mita or Midas. Midas probably takes the throne in 740 BC when, and he builds the um, Midas Mount Tumulus. That is 60 years after the fire. By the time Midas takes the throne, Middle Phrygian Gordian has already been built, I think. At least nearly all of it will have been built. So Midas rules from about 740 to 700 BC. And fortunately, and he's called Mita uh, in the Assyrian antles, annals, and the Phrygians are called Mushki or Mushku. So he is Mita of Mushku or Mita of Mushki. During this period, uh, fortunately, we have indications of what Midas was doing in the Assyrian annals, which is good because the Greek stories are all legendary, you know, having the ears of a donkey and the golden touch. But with the Assyrian records, those are being done at the time in which Midas is on the throne. They're speaking from the point of view of the Assyrians, not the Phrygians, but nevertheless, they're contemporary accounts. So it's clear that Midas was dealing with the Neo-Hittite city-states in the Southeast and encouraging them to move away from Assyrian control, as well as reaching out to Greece. But none of this has anything to do with the destruction level, which is again 60 years earlier than the point when Midas takes the throne. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... And there's another question here from Defne Gönenç. Can you please say again why we know Gordion with gold, although they did not use it? They looked golden due to the color of their dresses or the substances of their clothes? Yes, that's correct. Think, uh -huh. That's correct. We don't have much gold from Phrygian Gordian. We have a little bit, but only a very little bit. Little bit from the early Phrygian, a little bit from middle Phrygian, from the Midas mound, which again was intact, dating to the period, the beginning of Midas's kingship and never touched before the excavation, no gold whatsoever. So where did the story of the golden touch come from? we think that it comes from the special treatment that they used on their clothing using a kind of dye called gertite, which we've detected using scientific analysis, which made the clothing look golden. So the city would have looked golden because of what the people looked like wearing these elaborate golden clothes as they walk through the city in processions or festivals. That certainly is part of it. There's also a high amount, a high degree of brass in the metal vessels, which makes them also look sort of golden, even though they're not. So these two features together, the golden looking clothing and the golden looking, the golden kind of looking <laughs> bronze vessels that they had in their tombs, these may have associated the site and the kings more with the idea of a golden touch than you'd expect given the limited amount of gold that has been found in the tombs. Uh, thank you very much. Um, um, let me have a look at if you have more questions here. There are many thanks to you. And 
Akın Aykut wants to ask another question. I think he, I saw. Uh, he asks if any genetic research on any of the bones uh, were con conducted. Yeah, we don't, we're just beginning a new project that will, I hope, be international, that will analyze the bones of burials in southeastern Europe in the late Bronze Age, at Troy in the late Bronze, early Iron Age, and at Gordian in the Royal Burial Mounds in the early Iron Age and middle Iron Age. And I hope we'll be able to get enough genetic evidence to really prove this movement of the Phrygians from southeastern Europe to uh, central Turkey. We've also done genetic analysis on some of the burials from a Celtic deposit dating to the third century BC. And it is clear, I mean, we already knew this, but the genetic analysis makes it clearer that there is evidence for these Celts coming from Central Europe to Asia Minor in the third century BC. I mean, we know this from Hellenistic uh, historical accounts and settling at Gordian, but we can see it now in the genetic analysis of the bones. Well, that's really interesting. We are uh, looking forward to get the results of this study. And do you think, are we going to be able to visit you in Gordian next summer? Well, inshallah, I mean, it depends on COVID. We are hoping that we'll be able to be there for three months. Would be wonderful to have visitors. I hope that this is possible. This past summer, 2020, we were only able to work at Gordian for two weeks in August, and it was only a study season. So we hope to go back to digging and architectural conservation in 2021. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. It looks like we don't have any more, more questions anymore. So thank you very much again for, uh, for this wonderful lecture and accepting our invitation. Um, and greetings to USA and wish you also luck with the elections. <laughs> thank you, we need it. You need it, okay. Thank you very much again. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.